Welcome to the Market Huddle with Patrick the Content Machine Serezna and Kevin the Macro Tourist Muir. So grab a drink, get comfortable, and get ready for a deep dive into the markets. Take it away, guys. Is Lena going? It- Where are we going? We're rolling. <laughs> okay, sorry. Put that in there. Let's go from here. Hit it. <laughs> it's January 17, 2020, episode 63. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we welcome Brent Kochaba from SpotGamma.com to the show. Brent worked for B of A and Credit Suisse as both an equities broker and in algorithmic sales and trading for over 20 years. He then transitioned into institutional sales for Wolverine Capital Partners, representing their electronic derivatives trading platform. Currently, Brent trades some various proprietary strategies and runs SpotGamma.com, which publishes various metrics on options data. Brent shares with us gamma analysis from the S&P options pit and talks about what this means for the market going forward. Then we're going to talk charts with Patrick, and in our WTF video, McAfee runs for president. And in this week in trading history, we go back and uh, review Charles Ponzi, and then we're going to talk about the top three things to watch next week. But before we get started, let's get to our beer sponsor, Lena Hop on here. Who's uh, the sponsor this week? So our sponsor this week is Granville Island Brewing Company's Lions Winter Ale. They sent Uh, us more because I talked about it so good. That's right. This is one of your yeah. favorites, I bet. Yeah. Um, we have some notes from the sponsor. It says, our Lion's Winter Ale combines premium malt with aromatic specialty hops. The vanilla-like finish of this robust ale is a great excuse to get out of the cold and enjoy BC's favorite winter beer made from the finest natural ingredients. How fitting, oh considering my- BC's yeah. so cold right now. Yeah. Uh, the- yeah. But uh, we should have left this out. We should have left this outside. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> what? You like this, you know, Patrick? Yes. Oh God. Yeah, I'm gonna oh, stick with y- my know. pale ale. This uh this uh Lion's Winter Ale is I'm I'm a seller, but sorry. Mm. <laughs> this is good. I'm I'm in. I'm in. What do you think, right. Lena? Um I'm gonna save my rating for later, but uh, oh, okay. I, I have to I have to agree with you. I think I like the pale ale better. Okay. All right. Listen, stop shitting on the beer right off the bat. Okay, here we go. Uh, give us a disclaimer, Kev. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in the show. Side effects of too much huddle may include mad bullish delusion, sedated <laughs> ursine influenza, and silent put expiry mutation. <laughs> All right, let's get on uh, with the show. It's our pleasure to welcome Brent Kuchubo, author of the SpotGamma.com website. Uh, especially today, given that it's option expiration, we have a lot of people wondering about the gamma roll-off and what it means and how to interpret this. It's our pleasure to uh, to invite you on the show and to, for you to be here. Welcome, Brent. Th- thanks very much. Good to talk to you guys. So let's just jump into it because, uh, you know, there is a lot of people that uh, are having problems understanding what's happening in the marketplace with the preponderance of uh, S&P options and the gamma and what this means to kind of the marketplace itself. In the old days, the market kind of went up on its own and now everyone seems to be a a vol and gamma expert. But uh, we thought we'd get the actual vol and gamma expert with us. Uh, So what are you seeing? Sure. Uh, so it's it's kind of interesting time. As you mentioned, today was OPEX, and, and uh, that's usually a time when you see sort of the, the gamma fingerprints or dealer volume fingerprints of the market. And I, I particularly look at the close both uh, yesterday and today. You kind of see that ramp, you know, the last half hour trading where things kind of just kind of shoot straight up. And I think a lot of that is tied to uh, calls getting rolled up and out and call positions being closed. And so you see um, very short term, uh, very short term basis. You know some of the influences of the uh, of the gamma trade there. Okay, so, so, so why don't you Brent, explain to us when oh, people say gamma what they mean and just kind of a, a basic kind of understanding for those that aren't familiar with the options. Sure. So uh, most of the gamma models that you see out there, uh, I know you guys have Charlie from Numera on quite a bit, uh, and also uh, on Squeeze Metrics, a very popular site. You'll see um, they. They have this assumption that uh, all calls are 
are sold as a sort of a yield enhancement strategy. That means market mark, mark makers are uh, long calls, and they're also, um, conversely, they're also short puts. So all these models assume that the, the buy side, let's say the buy side is short calls uh, and long puts, and that puts the dealers in sort of, in sort of a collar position where they're going to be short deltas that they, that they need to hedge. So what GAM is, is it's trying to measure exactly how much uh, stock and future volume the dealers will have to trade relative to the total options positions uh, in the S&P. All right. So okay. now, Brent, uh, this has a bi- this has a big influence because, uh, especially on the upside, when the market is rallying, they tend to be compressing volatility because they're sellers of futures into strength, right? That, that, that's right. So what what long gamma or positive gamma is, is telling you is that the market should be mean reverting. So as the market is going up, dealers are going to be selling futures into that rising market, and conversely, as the market drops, they'll be buying to support the market. And so what you get if you sort of look at a back test of this, and we'll talk about this in a couple of minutes here, um, you'll see that the, the average volatility or the price distribution when the market's long gamma is much more condensed than when the market is you know, convert, you know, short gamma. So um, you're, you're showing a chart here that basically shows you that not only is the price distribution, meaning how much the S&P moves when, when the market is positive gamma, it moves much less. Um, it also has a slightly positive mean return. Uh, meaning that what happens is the market tends to go up ever so slightly and have a smaller you know, price distribution, high-low uh, movement on the day uh, versus when there's negative gamma, you get much bigger moves and it tends to actually have a little bit of a negative uh, mean return. Uh, for those that are at home and listening to this kind of on their ear set or whatever, it's uh, it's it's actually a fascinating chart. And what it shows is the two different curves of the actual uh, kind of distributions of the stock market returns. And you can see that the one when gamma is positive is very centered around, uh, well, it's actually centered to the positive, as Brent mentioned. And then when you look at it when they're short gamma, they're actually, it's very uh, kind of, it's a wide distribution with the tails, for example, being much wider. It's, uh, you know, Brent, that's a terrific chart. Uh, I, I've never actually seen that done before. Uh, how long does that go back uh, when we're looking at it? This particular study is only two years. Um, this, is, this is data that I derived, and then I've seen some other studies that go back uh, about 10 years, and, and the chart is actually very, very similar. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite interesting. It, it's also kind of interesting because when you sort of look back and sort of back test a lot of this stuff, you know, the last 10 years has been quite a bull market. So you get, you know, I, I wonder often how much times that, that skews this data a little bit, but, uh, you know, the, the sample set is what it is. Right. So why don't we go to kind of show what we're looking at in terms of the next slide with the option-based market signals. And sure. And I guess you just kind of walk through people what they can see in terms of that actual delta and gamma and how it looks at different points in the market. Yep. So sure. So essentially the, the way that the gamma trade usually sets up is as obviously uh, the market goes higher, gamma tends to build. So you should get more resistance as the market goes higher. So when we say more resistance – it means that dealers will have more futures to sell against the market as it rolls higher or as the market moves higher. And then obviously there's a there's a point if the market goes down where we, we call it the volatility trigger, but it's the zero gamma level. And where that is is where the market flips from positive gamma to negative gamma. And as we were talking about the distribution and movement of prices before, when we move to negative gamma, that's where you can get you know some really large drawdowns and volatility really spikes up. Uh, and you can see, you know, much much bigger movements in the market. Uh, so, now, yeah, sorry, what, what, what I find interesting is your gamma walls are pretty awesome, but there's that gamma flip, right? And uh, that that's interesting because you define it in this red zone as the high volatility zone, and the green zone is the uh, the that low volatility zone. So that gamma flip, and when when that high volatility comes in, that's uh, why don't you explain to our listeners what that entails? Like how how is that? What are we witnessing when this is uh, happening? Sure. So if you if you uh, add up all the open interest is how we kind of derive this data, all the S and P index options and spider open interest, and you measure that gamma, you can tell at which point dealers will hypothetically flip from uh, causing the mean reverting market, meaning they're supporting the market as it goes down. If the gamma flips to negative, it means that they start to sell as the market goes down along with it. So, so if you ex- were to have exacerbate per- the volatility, ex- exa- exactly. And that kind of harkens back to the price distribution slide that we were looking at before, where you get a wider distribution when you have negative gamma. 
The interesting thing about the high volatility sort of zone is that not, you know, typically when we think of higher volatility, we associate that with a negative return, uh, meaning that the market will go down. Uh, but that also relates to when the market bounces up. Obviously, the biggest positive days happen kind of after big drawdowns or big negative days. So, you know, volatility obviously works both ways. And I think a lot of times, you know, you get the initial move is going to be a down move, but that also, you know, that volatility trigger also tells you that you can also get just as big of a move back up as, you know, as, as, uh, as the kind of market whipsaws up and down. Right. And, 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 and you know, Brian, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Brian. No, I was, was going to say, and this sort of relates to sort of what we, we measure what are called put and call walls. And, and the, and that's tr where we try to estimate, you know, where are people going to start monetizing or where might, the market look for a bottom, you know, around these after entering sort of the vol high volatility zone. So that's the other sort of market that we have on those charts there. And and Brent, one of the flip sides to your kind of high volatility zone is during the low volatility zone. Although you were mentioning that dealers are selling the the futures as it goes higher, they're also buying back the futures as it, we get a little bit of a dip. Are they not? Yeah. So the way that I think about it, and that's kind of one of the things we talk about this call wall is that. Even if people are short calls, because of the decay, the natural decay of the options, and as we get closer to expiration, you know, calls start to lose value, and that's always going to kind of create and, and puts obviously lose value at the same time. So that's always constantly creating this dealer buyback that sort of happens every day, right? Because as those options lose value, the dealers hypothetically have too much short deltas on, and they're just constantly sort of in the market having to buy back a little bit, you know, every day. So I think it sort of drags the market higher slowly when you have long gamma. So, and, and do you think that that's what we see at the end of the day? Like, is that what, what pushes those guys as they have to hedge up and get themselves flat on yeah, a delta basis? Yeah, cer certainly on a day like today. I mean, I, in general, from some of you know my understanding of, of, of how some like big index funds and things like that trade the up the mark to close. So there's a lot of volume that happens in the close on a daily basis not related to, you know, options market making and dealers and that thing. But on a day like today, when you have such a big options expiration, you can kind of tell how much needs to be moved or rolled. And as we sort of mentioned at the start of the show, you had like the last 10 minutes of the day where all of a sudden the market just shoots straight up and there's not really a, a good reason for it. I mean, if you're a fundamental buyer, you're not just going to jam the market into the close like that, you know, just to kind of buy without regard to price. And, you know, so I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, hedging the book and making sure you're square at the end of the day. Um, so, so, so you know, yeah, yeah, Brent, so sorry. what I wanted to really kind of pick your brain on is, is someone who's tracking this, because I, I love knowing where the levels are, but I'm not actively um, kind of uh, making my own models around the gamma the way you do. And uh, so I'm fascinated to understand how this evolves, because you would imagine, and, and we do see it, which is that um, if you're an overwriter, and let's say you're a huge institution doing massive selling a premium up above, you're rolling forward, which is basically as you're getting in the money on your call rights, you're going to take a loss and roll it forward to a higher strike. And mm -hmm. so the, so as, as the uh, price of the market is rising, does it not push the belly of the curve continuously to the right? Like, as, as, is it just something that you, how, how does this evolve how, what, from your experience of watching this? Yeah, I think you're, you kind of hit the nail on the head there that, as it keeps rolling higher, you kind of keep drawing the market up. So one of the things that we watch is what we consider a bullish sign, or I consider a bullish sign, is when that we call it a high gamma strike, which is the, the biggest concentration of positive gamma at a specific strike. And when that gets rolled higher, we consider that a bullish sign because we think the structure or the range that the option market is pricing is moving higher. And when you take a deep in the money call or an at the money call and roll it to an out of money call, that's going to automatically create pressure for the market to go up because the dealer who was on the other side or has to hedge that deep in the money call suddenly has too many deltas and he needs to buy a bunch of them back, which obviously helps the market sort of shift higher and, right, and move right. up. So it, it you end up in this sort of cycle. And a lot of people have talked about, you know, a gamma trap, which is usually associated kind of like a volatility with a negative situation, uh, you know, where put buying creates dealer selling which creates more put buying in this in this scenario it's kind of the same thing with calls you know people who are sh selling calls and then rolling them higher automatically sort of make the market roll higher with it and then they sell more calls and that makes the market roll higher and sort of self-fulfilling prophecy in a way 
So, Brian, let's put this into practice and kind of use it in a real world example. And you've kind of sketched out here what happened in the Rand bombing. And why don't you walk us yeah. through what happened that evening and uh, and how it worked in terms of with the Gamma and the, uh, the your model? Yeah, this, this was something fascinating. Uh, one, because it took place obviously overnight. So the, the cash market wasn't open. And I, I, for one, think that the cash market, meaning the options market for S&P was open. The scenario might have been quite a bit different. Uh, but these are one of these, you know, a lot of times these levels come up where zero gain will actually be, or the volatility trigger level will actually be a spot for the market to bounce. And right. so what happened was you had this situation where the news comes out that there's a bunch of bombing happening, unfortunately for everybody, you know, the market starts to sell off and it drops straight down, you know, precisely to that 3185 level overnight, which is exactly where, you know, not only my model, but a couple of other models that you see around out there had targeted as the the zero gamma flip point and the market hits that level and bounces right back up to what I would call delta neutral and delta neutral in this case would, case would be where the market closed that you know the night before or at the at the close of the cash session and so you see these numbers and these things kind of pop up on, over and over again where these levels seem to matter and and you know whether it's a whole bunch of more people are just paying attention or that's actually where the dealers start to kick in and buy you know, it's it's uh, it's very interesting to see these, these things happen and, and repeat. Um, my sort of my sort of feeling was, had the cash market been open, you would have seen a more of a volatility spike because all those puts uh, that that are in the marketplace would have been picked up in value. They would have had to been hedged. Dealers would have to start selling futures, and that might have really broken that volatility trigger level. And you know, we're. So we may not have seen the same highs. Yeah, we might have seen the same highs. So, that, so like you know, it would have made a difference whether that happened during market hours versus uh, happening in in the overnight session, right? Yeah, I I, I think so. You know, spe- specifically because if if you're all those, you couldn't really price those puts the same way because the market was closed. You know, all the obviously futures options are open, but they're you know that market is not as large as the S and P cash cash market so it would have been you know very interesting to see what happened and, and i think that maybe that we would have broken through that voltage volatility trigger 3185 level uh, but instead so, we bounce off it and, and return to so, so brent that's actually a co- kind of complicated uh theory or kind of part of the mar- option market that maybe people don't understand so let's just kind of break that down a little bit if you mark your book higher meaning if you increase the volatility of it it actually changes your deltas and it means right. that you actually have to sell more to hedge it up if you're depending most likely in yeah. this scenario. And if that was to happen, your, your argument is that because it wasn't marked to market, meaning that the market wasn't really open yet, nobody marked up their vol. They just took care of their deltas. And because of that, we never actually got the spike in vol, which would have therefore caused even more selling and it might have fed on itself. Is that correct? Yeah, and and there's there was a there was a situation I remember sort of beginning of uh, December where there was a bad ISM number and then there was one large put buyer came out. I think he bought you know, twenty five thousand January around three thousand puts and the hedging. You know, obviously when that trade hits the tape, that has to be hedged. So you know, a bunch of deltas will get sold by the dealers and that can really chunk the market down pretty quickly. And then suddenly it starts like a cycle of put buying and then hedging. And and that's just an example of. When the market's open and vol sort of spikes, it sort of becomes the same cycle where the vol spikes, it makes puts worth more. That means I got to sell more futures as a, as a market maker. Uh, and then and that sort of feeds the cycle of the market going down. Do you think we're do you think we're vulnerable to that right now? The, the, the funny thing now is that, you know, game is very long. Uh, and, and very high, and, and we're solidly in control of sort of calls are sort of in control of the market. And so the answer is yes, but you need sort of a catalyst you know, for that to happen. You have uh, the market's very long gamma at the moment. I think the total numbers around we measure $1.8 billion in gamma. And that's a, that creates a pretty big floor that you know, will be used for mean reversion, meaning if the market does sell off a little bit, you know, there's a lot of dealer uh, notional value that can help to bid the market back up. And so you kind of have to wear through that. And that's one of the interesting things about options expiration is a bunch of options or call options will expire. So you have to see maybe, you know, a fair amount of that uh, gamma will be wiped off the table just following the, you know, OPEX. So that's something we're looking for next week. Do you have any idea of how it played out into the last um, 
uh, into this uh, weekend? Like, uh, did you did you see any of the numbers right here? Like, or, or did a lot of people roll it out? Are we going to still have that gamma there, or do you have any insight on this? What we're going to yeah, see what, on Monday? What? One of the kind of interesting things is that uh, today March volume was very high, and it looked like people were sort of skipping the February options expiration and rolling out to March. And March has actually a little bit of a lower gamma, obviously, than February would. Uh, and so we, we have this metric of a call wall, and uh, in the last two years, that wall has only been breached 14 times, uh, and, and that actually happened yesterday. And that means that we didn't actually detect that the market was rolling, um, rolling higher. Uh, the interesting thing is that the average return following when our sort of wall gets breached is a positive 70 basis points, meaning that, that when our call wall or what we think is sort of max resistance gets breached, that's, that's a bullish uh, tilt in the next five days. So what I'm sort of getting at is that even if the gamma did sort of get wiped off the table, it tends to have a bullish uh, t uh, tilt to it because what happens is, let's say, for instance, that we... Uh, all the January calls were just cl closed and they weren't rolled. Well, that means that the dealers have still all those short deltas that were hedged those calls. Uh, they don't need those deltas anymore, right? Because they weren't rolled or they're rolled to a much higher strike. Uh, the options are. So that means they have to buy back all those deltas. So you could actually kind of get like a last gasp effort up just as a function of dealers, like getting their book back to neutral, if that makes sense. All right. right. Okay. So you have the okay. next slide here, which is the two-year bands back test. Why don't you walk us through what that is? Sure. So the bands just show what our, our call wall, what we call our call walls and our put walls. And those are simply the highest concentration of the strike with the highest concentration of positive gamma and negative gamma. And as I sort of mentioned before, the, usually these call walls get rolled higher and that's a bullish sign for us because as we talked about earlier, the structure of the options market will get is, is pricing in now a higher market. And that tends to drag the market up. And so rarely, or not very often, is that is that call wall breach. And, and what it is, like just happened yesterday, and also happened on the December options expiration, that tends to tell you that the five-day return is going to be you know, pretty bullish. And we also think that the put wall works in the same way, that when the market gets in or around that put wall, it is actually sort of an indication that maybe we've approached the bottom in the market you know, when we have a pretty good sell-off. All right. All right. Uh, Yep. Brent, so now the, here's what I want to ask you, though. I mean, we had that same scenario of the call wall being violated all the way through December and January of 2000, going into 2018 before the right. ball event. So do you, do you have any insights on what happened there? And are the same kind of risks there going into uh, our, this February month here? Like, it, it, are the fact that we're violating this on the upside, I mean, where, where's the trigger for a, a reversion of this market? Yeah, and I, I've, I've uh, spent kind of a lot of time working out this, the, the comparisons to the January 2018 market. And, and I would say the one big fact that we obviously don't have now is, is the, how large the short vol complex is. And obviously that led to volume again. We don't have that scenario now. Uh, but, you know, maybe sort of like the quantitative easing Fed, you know, is providing that similar, you know, artificial fuel, so to speak. But it's a little outside my, um, my pay grade there. But anyways, the, um, the Jan in January of 2018, it was a very similar scenario, both in terms of the, uh, the way that calls were getting rolled up. But also what we saw was the call gamma started to exhaust itself into the roll. And that, and that sort of started to show itself this week a little bit. And what I mean by that is overall call levels started to come down. Uh, November of this year was the highest positive gamma readings um, that we've seen. And, and it was marked by a couple of the other large banks as well. Um, so it's not necessarily a bearish thing in general just to have overall gamma levels come down. But what I do think is maybe some cause for concern is that the appetite for rolling and the size of the roll doesn't seem to be quite as big as it's been. Uh, and that was a scenario going into 2018, January 2018 as well. So you have kind of a situation where it seems like maybe buyers are getting a little bit tired out. Um, and the other issue is that, you know, puts are obviously not in vogue at the moment. And so, you know, you can catch a lot of people sort of off sides if you have a catalyst. Right. right. And so, so, um, what, uh, so I'm going to take this one, Patrick. So last week we had Ben Eifert um, from QBR on our show, and he seemed to imply, and I, I'm kind of reading between the lines, but he was very worried about the kind of structural selling of volatility that is done. And uh, 
although we don't have as many negative uh, volatility instruments out in the marketplace, I'm wondering if it's still just as popular on the institutional level via swaps and other th- kind of instruments of that nature. What's your feeling on that? I, mean, I think that there's that there is a big desire and drive for for yield, and I think you see that um, you know in in call selling and 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 you know we have very low interest rates, and so I, I don't think that the the desire to sort of enhance yield is is really going away. I think a lot of people are stuck in a scenario where they have to you know do what they can right. to you know to drive you know get a higher yield. So the, the swaps market is something that I'm not very well versed in, but I don't see the situation. Um, you know, changing much simply because, again, you know, we're all in a situation with with uh, these large index funds and pensions and the like, where you know they, they are starved for yield, and, and these low interest rates are, are certainly not helping this uh, situation for them. Right. All right. So, so Brent, now you have this chart here um, talking about positive gamma back test. So, what are we looking at on this chart, and uh, what does it mean? Uh, yeah. So we we talked earlier about the the fact that uh, the the market. Uh, has a positive mean return very slightly when when gamut is positive. So there's a back test here showing that if you just owned S and P uh, when when gamma was greater than zero, uh, you actually trail the market a little bit. And one of the interesting things that leads to sort of conversation about gamma is that it doesn't do a terribly great job of picking tops in the market and also bottoms. So what you see is that uh, the strategy has a lower uh, drawdown. Like for instance, you miss if you would miss the drawdown of December last year uh, and also the August August of this year you out of the market. So those are great things. But the biggest returns also, as we said before, was was off of the bottom, right? Because you you will miss, for instance, buying the December dip if you just did, if you only bought when the market was long gamma. So what happens is a lot of people ask this question is, well, if, if gamma is such a good predictor of market, why don't you just own S and P, you know, when gamma is positive and leave it at that? And the answer is, well, you can do that. You happen to trail the market in this case a little bit. And the answer is because, you know, you don't do a good job of buying the dip. Right. Uh, when, yeah. When but you know what, on. Brent, just kind of spitballing here, but one idea maybe to be uh, to own the uh, kind of strategy when gamma is positive, but lever it up. Because but looking at this, it looks like it has a lower volatility to me and therefore probably has a higher sharp. Yeah, it does. It does have a, a lower volatility. You can see kind of in the graph, and I apologize for people listening that can't see this, but you would have sold if you, you know, gamma flipped negative sometime. For instance, in I think it was early December, around like the second week of December last year, or first week in December. So you would have missed a big drawdown there. But of course, you don't get back in the market till early January when the market had kind of fully recovered. So you know, the leverage scenario is definitely you know one to consider. And because you missed some of those drawdowns, um, I think the biggest drawdown there is four percent. I want to say, if I remember correctly. Uh, so that that's not a bad idea, right? Okay, let's move on right. to your next uh, chart here. It says the cycle of crash protection. Why don't you walk us through what you uh, what you were talking about here? Yeah, this this is sort of one way that I look at a lot of the, the V bottoms that we tend to have, where you get you know big sell offs, and then the market will just kind of bounce back to where it was you know a couple of days before, as we sort of saw uh, you know on steroids in the December of last year, but also uh, in August of this year. And this is similar to what we were talking before, about before, where you get a cycle of, of put buying causes dealers to sell futures, and then you know that will cause more put buying and higher vol and that kind of thing. And the same thing happens on the unwind, where at some point, as you guys know, puts are very sensitive to implied volatility. So if you're owning puts that are going in the money on a big crash, you need to usually act pretty quickly to monetize those because if the market just stops going down, ball comes in and you can lose a bunch of money on your puts, you know, they lose value pretty quickly. So you're forced to sort of actively roll or close those positions, those put positions. And as you do that, that causes dealers to have to buy back futures. And that can obviously cause the market to roll back up, cause short covering, and you kind of get the reverse. And I think that's why typically now what you see is V bottoms as opposed to sort of where we sit, you know, we go down to a level and just sort of stay there for a couple of weeks. We tend to get this, wow. you know, kind of vicious cycle of up and down. And it also harkens back to the idea of when we have negative game, we have larger volatility uh, because I think of all these, these cycle, of, you know, winding up with put volume and unwinding, um, you know, unwinding those put positions. So when that's we're actually looking at that. Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Patrick. I'm sorry. No, no. If you have a comment, I was just going to go to the next slide. So, well, uh, yeah, go to the next slide because I think it's actually interesting. And I and I had, I kind of never thought about my to you myself that the V bottoms were a function of the of option market, and and yeah. kind of like 
That's a, that's actually fascinating and, and uh, interesting in that as we use more options, it might mean that we don't uh, we get more we don't get those rolling kind of crazy bot or kind of rolling uh, developing bottoms and we get more just these down and then straight back up. Yeah, and and I think so on this particular graph, you know, I try to show that just some of the solves from this previous year. What what tends to happen is that the V bottom will kind of bring you back to where we started and and a lot of times they'll look at where we started is is sort of what was neutral or where dealers or the market in general was neutral when the whole thing started so you'll right. see like the initial rebound will pause where it sort of started and a lot of that can mm -hmm. be you know maybe technical traders looking at previous highs and things like that but it seems to happen you know over and over again and and i typically watch things on a on a max of a monthly cycle so a lot of those dips will happen within that sort of 30 day you know, window as it, as it might be. And, and the other thing to sort of note is that a lot of this, you know, it, a lot of this happens around whatever the macro trend might be in the first place. So the current chart we're looking at is a long-term chart over the last seven years and obviously has a very sharp trend higher. And we kind of get these mean reversion, you know, highs and lows around whatever the general trend is in, you know, in the market. So I don't think that the options market controls, you know, where we're going for 2020, but it, it will control sort of the up and downs or influence the market, you know, in its overall general trend, if that makes sense. Right. Let's go to this next slide because you're kind of remar remarking on the similarities between Jan 2018 and Jan 2020. And, uh, yeah. I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. It feels exactly <laughs> the same. Uh, why don't you walk us through what Just you're going to have? A, it's going to have a different trigger obviously than the vol, but still, yeah. well, it might it not, I'm not as, I'm not as convinced that it is going to have a different trigger than vol. I just think that there might not be an XIV to, to um, yeah, the the funny thing is I didn't get a chance to update the slide from yesterday today because we, we tacked on another percent. So I think we're almost up an identical percent uh, from January 2018 to today, which is I think it was uh, about 12 or 13 percent in the month of January. And that's followed by a very strong November and December. I think we added uh, maybe three percent in November and December. So, you know, the market's had one heck of a run. And one of the similarities or, or sort of things that we were looking for, talking about how gamma starts to draw down and reduce. And that was one of the things that we saw in January 2018. And what I, w one thing that was interesting is the week after OPEX in January 2018, the market added, I think it was 3%. Uh, so that would be this upcoming week if you're kind of going to compare. And I think some of that was dealer covering after the roll. So, so we had a smaller roll. Dealers are too long. You kind of get one last gasp up and then whatever trigger might be to sort of cause a little bit of selling. And that kind of causes a bigger cascade because, you know, a lot of this is just call volume that's sort of bringing the market up. Uh, and obviously we've had, you know, quite an extended move higher. So even if you were just have a small correction, wow. you know, we could have a 10% correction that just gets us back to where we were, you know, in November, December. So, it's, yeah. you know, and, and so, what do you mean one last week? No. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're 100 percent right. So it's not one of these things we're calling for, you know, this this uh, really nasty, awful, you know, destruction of everything sort of scenario. It's really just sort of look, we're we're possibly quite extended. Maybe we just go back to where we were, like you said, you know, two weeks ago. And that also is a yeah. problem trying to call this top. Is that if you thought the top was yesterday, you know, now you're in the hole another, you know, percent. Um, one of the interesting things is we have the FOMC on, on the 29th, and we also have, you know, Apple earnings. And that's also that same week, which would be not this upcoming week, but it was sort of the Monday after um, where the market topped out in January 2018. And, and so maybe the Fed says something here just to, just to make the thing completely rhyme. Maybe um, the market's just ready for it, and the, the, they'll make the Fed the excuse, ir irrespective of what they say. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. The, the market, you know, the market needs a narrative oftentimes to, to grab onto. And, and, you know, I'm with you a lot of times. It doesn't necessarily matter what the reason is. The market is primed to, to sort of correct itself. Uh, and, and so sometimes people just need, you know, a story to kind of grab onto. Um, yeah, yeah. One, of the, one of the things that we looked at was the, the amount of deltas in the market. So, you know, how much are options in the money typically will determine what the deltas are. Um, the deltas in January 2018 peaked at options expiration and even though the market was higher the following week the deltas didn't uh, exceed the higher level from opex meaning that there wasn't necessarily more call volume or more in the money calls it wasn't options driving the market higher you would think that if the market higher there would be you know a higher delta level on the market so what they basically told you is the options were 
not pricing in or, or, or not reflecting the same sort of like bullishness, I guess, that, that we had seen the week before. And so we don't yet know what the scenario is today, but there was obviously a big peak uh, before OPEX here. And, and next week, we might see that sort of same scenario where the deltas are lower this week. And that might kind of indicate that things are getting a little bit tired. Right, right. Okay, Brent, that's some great stuff. Now, so let's uh, take a little time now to talk about you a little bit and to get to sure. know, you know, how, how you came about to be such a gamma and option expert. Uh, why don't you walk us through? Where did you go to university? I went to the University of Connecticut. Uh, so okay. and I went to school for what's called emerging technologies, which is kind of a mixture of, of business and um, and computer science. Uh, ah. So. So you're, yeah, a was, uh, you're a real propeller head. You're a real propeller head. About that, I was I was, uh, I was joking with my wife because you know I was in, in so many computer courses and I, I and no one had ever mentioned the term you know Facebook or Google or whatever and we kind of yeah. you know, knew computers before all that existed. It's kind of funny. <laughs> okay, so you you're, do you go straight to Wall Street from a graduation or what do you do? How does your yeah path I worked go? Uh, I worked for. Uh, Bank of America Securities before that was, that was before the Merrill Lynch sort of uh, acquisition, and I was in electronic trading and, and program trading there. So I was working with uh, uh, equity algorithms and also doing some agency brokerage. So we would deal a lot with the uh, the index funds when they needed to rebalance. You know, they have to buy all the components of the S and P. So you help facilitate that. Um, so you're dealing with you know large baskets and and also it was sort of the interesting because it was the start of electronic trading. So you know the VWAP algorithm had had been around not for very long and then everyone was sort of designing this was pre dark pools and all that and then i and i also worked on the first desk of when we launched electronics options trading which was kind of interesting because my job was basically to call up clients and tell them you could trade options electronically and, and they couldn't really understand what it meant uh and now that's just sort of <laughs> the, it's just the de facto way that people do it it's uh it's pretty funny okay and then so you're at bank of america and you and you eventually go to credit suisse Right, and I helped launch their um, options, uh, electronic options platform there, and I was there for a few years um, working on some different strategies with them and, and talking to clients, and then I went to uh, an options market maker called Wolverine, uh, where I was on their uh, broker side, uh, working on their electronic trading platform as well. And, right, so uh, and Wolf- from the- Yep, Wolverine is, is is Wolverine is the uh, like they're the ones who use that WEX software, right? Am I, have I got it cor- right? Cor- that, that's right. Yep, they use the WEX software. Uh, and then obviously there are, there are options. Well, they, they make market in a whole bunch of different make markets in a whole bunch of different securities. Uh, but I worked on the right with the Wex on the broker dealer side. Nice. Okay. And then um, so what got you to start making Spot Gamma? Like, why do you walk us through kind of what you did? You see a need for it or where? Yeah. Where it... Uh, yeah. I, I started building some options models, uh, working on some proprietary trading strategies. And um, and that led me into so I was I had the idea or the concept of call walls and put walls and sort of looking at the my, my view was in general that the options market maker options dealers were kind of the biggest consistent players in the market on a day in and day out basis. And that as liquidity in the whole marketplace has sort of come down, I think, you know, there's a whole bunch of bank research out there that shows that, you know, liquidity is is just not what it used to be. And so I, I felt like the options market has a big control, you know, over on the short term, you know, the ways that the market is moving. So I started to build some models and I came across, across uh, squeeze metrics who opened my eyes to a bunch of things. And then obviously, you know, some of the mirror charts and things like that. Uh, and so one of the things that I struggled with was uh, I could see like, if you weren't a big institutional client, it was hard to get, you know, Charlie, Charlie's charts from the mirror, you know, hard to see those gamma uh, profiles and things like that. And I had them. So I, I figured I'd put them on a website and, and, you know, people really were, the response was pretty wild. Uh, they were just yeah, very no, it's, interested. It's in, great. In I, I, I go to your website on a daily basis. I love it. Oh, I guess, uh, highly, much, highly so recommend it. It's, um, I recommend it to all our listeners, uh, <laughs> go to spot gamma.com. Uh, char- uh, sorry. Uh, Brent has always thrown up some great, uh, charts, uh, for everybody to w- check out. Yeah, for sure. So, so Brent, yeah. one of the questions I have for you is, you know, this is, we've used this, um, kind of theory or this uh, analysis for the S and P market. Why don't people use it for the bond market or for individual stocks and, can't it apply to all kind of markets where there's a liquid, uh, you know, vast amount of options trading? Yeah, I, I think that's the key is what you just said is you need a, you need a vast amount of options trading. And if, there, if there's not enough option trading, the strikes aren't kind of concentrated enough, you end up with not being able to build as, as good as a profile. So, for instance, if, 
if you look at the NASDAQ market, you can kind of get some decent levels on it. In general, you can get pretty decent levels with Q, with the Qs and the, and the NDX if you combine those. Uh, but like with the Russell, there's just not enough volume. It just doesn't, you don't get the same profile. Uh, and I think it's because the dealers aren't going to provide enough volume. The options market's not big enough to, to get the same uh, volume <clears throat> to help, right. you know, uh, quote unquote, control the market or influence the market in the same way. So the S&P but- is, is kind of unique there in that in this situation but don't you think treasury bonds would be kind of in the same league or no uh, to be honest with you, i don't i haven't looked at treasury bonds it's, it's probably some uh, i've looked at uh at natural gas uh, there's some people who have asked me to look at bitcoin uh the bitcoin uh <laughs> options that recently came out it's the same situation there's a few stocks where it seems to work pretty well um there's also some interesting situations maybe with like <clears throat> excuse me like a tesla where there, there's a lot of options trading, but you sort of need to change maybe your assumptions of, of which direction those options are in. For instance, I don't, you know, maybe people aren't short all those many, you know, that many calls in Tesla. It'd be kind of a dangerous situation. So there's a lot of options volume, but do you want to make the same assumptions that everyone's short calls and long puts? You know what I mean? Well, um, that's a great so, point. I, I, had, I actually had always wondered how you came up with the the idea about the uh, calculating the gamma because I couldn't understand how you knew whether it was an opening or closing. And yeah, you, uh, I guess, you, you, sorry. <laughs> no, uh, sorry. you kind of make those assumptions. And, and what happens is when you back test those assumptions, you end up with, you know, distribution data like we like we showed before. And, and obviously, you know, not everyone's short calls and uh, there's some long calls in there. And and I also you know think that in general, a market maker can't have a negative Vega profile. I mean, I don't, I don't think they're you know, their risk officers are going to accept them sort of just being short ball and, and perpetuity kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I think at the tails, you know, the, the models change a little bit, but, but the data, the data, when you back test it and run it on a, on a, you know, a daily basis, um, seems to provide enough of a, of a, uh, of an edge as it, as it were. And, and I also think in some respects, it may not matter which way people are positioned, um, simply because where all the volume is taking place, you know, the attention moves to the market just on the natural way that people are hedging and trading around those strikes, if that makes sense. Right. So um, you've been in the market a long time and actually uh, your career resembles mine. I was actually an index trader and at the forefront of uh, computerized trading in Canada. And uh, I was just wondering, yeah, I was just wondering what uh, you kind of have seen over the last 20 years in terms of how the market has changed, what your biggest observation is and where you might see the opportunities for young people or old people like me that are willing to do some computer work (laughs) or anything like that. What, 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 give us some insights about kind of your 20 years, like, uh, what's changed? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's been really fascinating because I, I came on, uh, at the end of sort of the, the pit trader and the voice trader and voice brokerage, you know, that they're obviously still around a lot of the banks, but you know, when I started, when I started electronic trading had just started, uh, we were still getting a lot of orders by email and sort of trying to, you know, build express sheets and things like that. And so, I really saw the kind of the electronic revolution of all the different exchanges coming online. I mean, there was only one uh, electronic options exchange, you know, when I had started doing that. And obviously there's, a, I don't know how many, there's 13 or something. Um, and so that electronification was really kind of a revolution and, and it really spread into retail at this point. I mean, uh, the access to the, the trading tools and things that you get is, is, is pretty amazing. And now the financialization is really, you know, continuing. I mean, on an individual basis, you know, you get these, uh, these people advertising uh, um, AI systems that will help you model your retirement and that kind of thing. And so um, it's, it's been interesting. I think Wall Street headcount has probably reduced quite a bit since I started. And I think a lot of the, the compensation that was there for, uh, for sales and trading has, has probably come down. Um, you know, but if, you're, if you have a lot of good relationships and things like that, I think you'd still do, do pretty well there. But um, it's, been, it's been quite a revolution. So um, I, I was right. thinking about... Yeah, going forward is a very tough thing to figure out at this point. You know, what comes after, uh, the, you know, the complete electronification of everything? Maybe it's crypto. I don't know. Are you bullish or bearish on the uh, kind of financial industry? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I'm bullish on it. And, you know, I think you you got to you got to evolve with it. Um, it's a uh, you know, it's a necessity. And uh, and we all need to retire and we all need some yield on our um on our retirement investments. So I think it's, you know, <laughs> being around for a while. What do you tell young kids that are kind of coming to you and saying they want to get in the industry? How do you, what advice do you give them? 
uh, you, you need to involve yourself in data science. And I think that almost goes for every industry, you know, obviously it's obvious in finance, yeah. but, um, you just, you need to know, you know, uh, statistics and probability. I mean, uh, th- those are such a, a big, uh, piece of the environment now. Um, and, and, you know, managing data, understanding databases, all that kind of thing. I mean, it's, uh, it's where everything is, is in, in where it's going. So it's, uh, it's really vital. Are you right, a Brent. Python? Or, well, no, Patrick, oh. you know what? I know you want to get a story because yeah, uh, Brent's oh, going to give oh, us yeah, a, yeah, a Margaret Huddle story. But I just want to know, I, you know, I'm talking to a computer nerd like myself. Are you right. a uh, Python guy or an R? Like, what do you do? No, all your yeah, everything, is, uh, everything is Python. It's, uh, it's just amazing what you can do with it. And it, it makes it so easy. Yeah. So you're a Python guy. And do you, uh, do, have you actually used Tableau? I was just starting to get using, do, using Tableau a little, and I was re- quite impressed with it. No, I'm not familiar with that. I'll have to I'll have to check that out. Yeah, you should go do it. Okay, so Patrick wants to get on with it because he doesn't want uh, computer <laughs> nerds talking about like uh, the, the computer. Well, programs. listen, I want to hear a good story. The okay, huddlers yeah. love uh, huddlers love to hear a good story. Like, okay, so yeah. Brent, uh, I we. It, I asked you if uh, if you had a good story from your early years in the tr- uh, trading and uh, and so what what do you have for us? Uh, did you, tell me tell us a story of something that happened to you early in your career that's funny. Yeah, uh, well, when I was I was a junior trader and all the interns were going to go down to the New York Stock Exchange and this was right around the year 2000. So you know it was still quite a hub and it was you know very active and there was a lot of trading still going on down there. And so you know I said great, you know I've, I've never been, I'd like to go. So. We were doing the tour of the exchange, and it took us out on the floor. You know, if you remember those CNBC days, you see people running all over on the screen. You know, it was a it was yeah. a pretty active and exciting place to go. And and I went up to the the uh, one of the specialist posts, and it was the Hog Post H O G. And uh, we were with a group of interns, and the and the specialist is turning around talking to everybody. And he looks at me, and he says, um, "You know, what what are you all doing down here, or whatever?" And I said, "Oh, I'm with the electronic trading desk. I'm just taking a tour." And the guy lost his mind he was so angry with me because i think i had represented you know the sort of the change of his industry and everything that was going around and and he really like lit into me and i was you know 21 22 years old and i kind of didn't really know what to say or what to do and this went on for a couple minutes and finally he got a big order and it was it was really funny because i was just sitting there you know really embarrassed and shy and and when i turned around all the interns had left and they left me alone standing there uh, so that's that's kind of a funny story. That, that is, that is awesome. Yeah. It's really, funny. yeah, awesome. yeah, really, okay. you know, really, 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 really quite. So uh, it was really a jarring well, experience for me for a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> those uh, New York Stock Exchange guys, uh, I can imagine they would probably feel pretty threatened because the reality was that those jobs were were kind of on their way to the dustbin, and yours was a kind of growing going forward, right? Yeah, and I was only you know twenty two years old or whatever I was, so I was like I was kind of that young propeller head, I guess, in a way that yeah, <laughs> uh, you know I, I <laughs> Brent, I was uh, when I was at my bank, I started writing an interlisted arbitrage program so that we could arb between New York and Toronto the stocks automatically using the computer. And my boss said to me, "What are you doing?" And I said, "Well, I'm writing this program so we can arb it." And he said to me, "Why are you doing that? I already have thirteen guys doing that." Because <laughs> they're going to be a computer, and uh, so unfortunately, those thirteen guys were replaced with one computer. Eventually, it took a little while, but it was good. Anyways, that's a terrific story, Brent. Thank you so much for being on. Why don't you tell people where they can find you, where they can uh, learn about more about you, and to get the fascinating charts and stuff that you've been talking about today? Sure. Uh, all my stuff is on SpotGamma.com, and my Twitter handle is at SpotGamma, and we run a an email subscription service so you can sign up and get a couple emails a day from us with the with the AM and PM gamma updates on a little bit of analysis uh, on the day's trading. Terrific. Well, thank you very oh, much great. for being with us. It was a real pleasure having you on, Brent. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I appreciate so- it. Thanks a lot, Brent. Patrick, it's that time of week. Talking charts with Patrick. What do you got for us? All right. Well, listen, I didn't have much time to prep this. I'm out here on the Oh, uh, excuses, West excuses. Coast. I know, I know. But uh, listen, I, I, I just want to talk about some of these cool charts of what's going on. First of all, the S&P 500 hasn't let up. We just heard about from Brent. And, uh, and you know, usually in the days after the expiry, there's still some uh, gamma influences that could potentially drive this market higher. The interesting thing is, is that the measured move on the S&P from uh, the technical techniques that I use uh, suggest uh, a measured move as high as 
is 33.75, which is still 50 points higher. It would be interesting if that actually housed, give or take, 25 points where where the uh, where the swing high comes in on the market. I want to, I don't want to say anything, something more ominous, but a market rising at this speed inevitably is going to have a mean reversion, and it'll be interesting to see what level that that really starts from. Uh, the other interesting that I want thing that I want to move on is the dollar, and uh, the U.S. dollar is uh, put a breakout candle in. I mean, we talk Dixie all the time, but to, uh, just connecting all these pre, uh, highs sort of as a uh, connecting trend lines, you can see a big breakout candle, but that breakout candle come off a specific currency, and that's the Euro USD. And um, this breakdown, I was watching the 111 level. One, uh, You and Cuppy are all like uh, super bullish here on this Euro, but this price action to me is, uh, is very vulnerable and very weak. Uh, they just simply have not been able to put together any uh, uh, strength towards the uh, the euro to su- suggest that it's uh, imminently going higher. And this breakdown, if this follows through next week and pushes down toward 110, that could really mark the end of this little uh, bounce here on the euro. And I would not be uh, surprised if uh, about a weakness could come on the other end of it. What do you think of that, Kev? You know what, Patrick? I, I, I hate to tell you this, but I agree with you, which means it's probably headed higher. What? Oh, you gutturing my trade. I am gutturing right. your trade, buddy. I, I I liked my position. You know what? You you and Cuppy had an edge. You calculated it. That's okay. I'm willing to give you guys. A, you know, sometimes you have to give the market makers something in order to get your position. And uh, and so I gave <laughs> That's you guys good. a small. That's good. I got to give up the big. Got to give up the big. Yeah, exactly. In order to have the edge, right? <laughs> yeah. Interestingly enough, uh, Japanese yen continues to break down. It was a, a and this was like a a, a classic. Uh, pop and drop that uh, that I love to see on charts, which is that almost all technicians saw this breakout that happened. Actually, let me flip it on the USD yen so that um, for the way our forex traders look at it, you had that that breakdown that tr- normally would have triggered a, a, a flood of selling orders as the trend would have been reversing on the other side, and instead it kind of washed everything out down there and then breaks out to higher highs. Uh, it'll be fascinating to see whether that US dollar continues. To, to strengthen against the yen. I still think we, we have a bet on this, so I'm obviously expressing bias here toward 112, 113, uh, but I'm rooting for it. <laughs> yeah, I'll take the other side of that, Patrick. I, I, of course you, know what, you are. Like, You've, and I, that's I, why we have. That's why we. What do we yeah. have? A steak or a burger on this one? Which one? I can't remember. The, or was or was this the the highest stakes? Uh, steak. Oh, uh, like a, the market huddle, the, market huddle menswear. Yes, it might Isn't actually this... be market the market huddle men's menswear. Oh, I go uh, go U.S. dollar go, buddy. I I want to <laughs> see you in that outfit. Uh, it's uh, anyway. We'll we'll watch and see. Anyway, I wanted to just uh, do a shout out to three stocks. All right. First of all, we have to look at Apple and uh, Apple continues to trug along, closing uh, 318.73 into the weekend. Um, You know, it it continues to just tack on 10, 20 billion dollars of market cap in a couple of days, just over and over again. It's just this exponential rise. Hey, listen, why can't it be a two trillion dollar company in a couple of weeks? Why not? I mean, at this pace, it's going to be there. Uh, But I I'm a seller like this. This is going to run out of steam. And I think that the top of Apple is going to probably uh, come in line with the S&P short-term swing highs. And so let's uh, let's keep an eye on it. The other, the other one, obviously, we have to talk about is Tesla. And um, uh, it was the Morgan Stanley downgrade, wasn't it, uh, that, that caused yeah. that turn? Well, it caused, uh, it caused it to go down for, what, an afternoon? <laughs> a morning. Actually, a morning. It, it didn't the, even it, make it to the afternoon. Oh come on! It, it hasn't really recovered, dude. Uh, after after that that five forty print on the uh, upside, uh, it's it's fallen back to five hundred and it's muddling there. And so so it, for me, this uh, uh, I'm asking the important question: Have we seen? the high on Tesla. Uh, now, w- two days of selling is far too premature to do any confirmation that the selling is, is here and that it, the top is in. I don't want to be caught, um, uh, you know, misinterpreted by our, our listeners. But the uh, reversals start like this, which is, uh, you know, they blow off to the upside and then they start selling and they don't recover. And uh, it will be very interesting next week to watch whether whether Tesla can make it back to 540 or whether it keep if, if it breaks below the 500 level 
Well, Patrick, I should be listening to you because I remember when Cuppy and I were chatting about this, you said there was a possibility for an explosive rally. And I think even though you used the word explosive, it, you underestimated how much oh, it was yeah. going to rise. I was thinking like four – we were do, we were talking about it around 400. And I was like, oh, it could go to 450, 475. No, the freaking thing went to 540, yeah. 550. So it was kudos just, to you, buddy. You nailed it. Uh, it was explosive. It was crazy. One of the largest short squeezes in all history. It's going to be right it's, up it's, there with Volkswagen and uh, – I don't know what else was short squeeze. Some of the good I, Volkswagen Porsche was probably one of the classic ones. It's yeah. not quite in that league, but it's it's definitely it's one of the big ones that's got to hurt. All right, now the last one I want to touch on is Boeing. Uh, you know, a number of CNBC uh, pundits. I'm not going to mention any specific names, but there's been a number of people that have been trying to put a bull angle on this. But I have to look at this chart and say it still looks like shit. Um, Who, and, uh, Patrick? And, I'm going to make you name names. Who talks about this from the bull side? No, I will not. All come right. on. Um, oh, come on. Oh, you know, a Kramer and all of the company. Uh, okay. I, I've are heard a number. They... I've, I've heard a number of BNN guys come on as well. I'm not going to. I'm not going to start calling these. But the point. Is is there's a lot of people trying to make a a, a case that uh, that uh, Boeing bottom should be in and that this was cheap. But I remind everyone that Boeing is still trading at a higher price than it did in uh, in December of 2018 when it w- the there was not a single plane that uh, crashed at that moment. So we're still trading at a price level that is arguably higher than it was trading before any of these problems emerged. Yeah. You know what I would say, though, to you, Patrick? I'm not disagreeing. It looks like shit. It's trading terribly. It does have that Buffett headline risk, though, that there's rumors that he's buying. And if it gets ever substantiated, this thing, you know, could gap 20, 30 bucks in an instant. Right. Well, listen, I, look, I don't think the company's going bankrupt. I think it's going to be, uh, be a buy and dip inevitably. But this chart looks terribly weak and vulnerable down back down to those December lows of 290. Look, I mean, we're in this epic stock market rally where there's huge index buying coming in. Uh, Boeing's a big component and it's not catching the bid. Like I, if, if it can't rally in this environment, uh, I think it's going lower first. Okay. Anyway, you heard that's, it. That's that's uh, that's uh, the charts I wanted to talk about. Okay. All let's right. Go on to the next thing. What do we got? Let's, well, this, this week, week in trading his. Yeah, it's, his, I'm supposed to. Be, I'm supposed to read that. Sorry. Well, go ahead. This week, s- re- re- <laughs> this week in trading history. What do you got for us, Patrick? All right. Well, it was uh, it was uh, in January of 1920. When uh, Charles Ponzi started his uh, own company called the Securities Exchange Company to promote his new scheme, the SEC. It's hilarious. Ca- it was it was called the Securities Exchange Company, the, the, the SEC. original SEC, the original SEC, and so uh, and so uh, Carlo Pietro Giovanni. Uh, uh, Tabaldo Ponzi, or which wow, is uh, well also done. known, I uh, thank you. Uh, was also known as Charles Ponzi. Was born in Italy in 1882, uh, and um, it was uh, when he was 21 uh, in November of uh, 1903 that he arrived in Boston aboard the SS Vancouver. Come on, um, really? Uh, yeah. And, nice. Uh, and so, do you think they uh, called uh, him Chuck? Do you think when he got to America, they said none of this, Charles? We're going to call you Chuck. I think so for sure. Chucky right? Chucky Ponzi. Yeah. And so <laughs> so he was uh, in an interview he was basi- he, he gambled away most of his life savings during the voyage to America. <laughs> And he, he didn't landed. Even make, it, he he did, didn't even make it there without going he, bankrupt. He he landed in the uh, in the country at two, uh, with two and a half dollars of cash in his pocket, but a million dollars of hopes and dreams in his uh, in his head. Right, and um, he quickly learned English, and he uh, and he spent the next few years doing odd jobs uh, on the East Coast, dishwasher and all sorts of stuff. It was interesting, uh, but ultimately he got fired. Uh, uh, from as a waiter uh, for shortchanging his customers and theft should have been really? the first warning sign. The first warning sign, yeah. <laughs> first warning sign. <laughs> now, so so then by 1907, uh, after some uh, years of failing to do uh, well in the United States, he moved 
north of the border to Montreal, where oh. he became where he became an assistant teller on a newly formed Banco uh, Zarossi, a bank, uh, uh, basically an Italian bank to to service a lot of Italian migrants arriving in the city, and so he. Uh, it, it, Think about it. You don't make it in the U.S. Come and uh, work in the banking sector in Canada. It, it's it, it just makes sense. <laughs> it's <laughs> anyway. That's like our motto. Don't make yeah. it in the U.S. Come get a job in Canada. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so, so anyway, uh, and eventually he makes it back down to the U.S. and he he comes upon a, a really interesting uh, development, which is that in the in this uh, post World War One period. There was uh, uh, this uh, international reply coupon, IRC as they're known, and essentially uh, he saw a weakness in the system and he thought he could use it to exploit money. And it's basically postage. Essentially what would, uh, it implies is that uh, you, a correspondence between different countries, you could pay for postage in your home country. Uh, and subsequently, um, the postage counts in uh, to deliver the postage in the next country uh, at the at the same price. And so he became the first one to form a arbitrage of uh, of noticing that there was that there was a massive mispricing of postage between uh, Italy and and the U.S. in the, in the excess of like 400 percent between the different thing, and he realized that if he buy like these um, these stamps on the one side and and sell them on the other, you could profit all of this profit, and well, he took it and ran with it. Nice. He ran with it. So it was in January of 1920 that he started that securities exchange company to promote the scheme. And so in this first month, 18 people invested in his company with a total of $1,800. Like a prudent Ponzi, he, pay, he promptly paid them the very next month with the money obtained from new set of investors. Ah, <laughs> uh, where have we heard this before? It's named after him, hence why, like Mer Bernie Madoff and many, it's a Ponzi scheme, right? And so uh, he obviously set up a large office and word spread about the investment. Uh, and, and he hired agents and paid them generous commissions for every dollar they brought in. And just in, uh, in a one month's time, from February to March 1920, uh, the amount invested risen from 5000 to 25000 thousand to sixty two thousand then three hundred and nine thousand just kept going uh, and uh, it went from uh, initially starting with a group of migrants to uh, uh, prestigious um, uh, investors in the Boston area all starting to get caught up in it by May 1920 he made four hundred and twenty thousand dollars which by the way let's uh, inflation adjust this I mean that's probably what five to twenty million dollars of today well, I think dollars. it's more no, well, no, probably it's more. right. So, like, it's just when we're talking four hundred twenty thousand, people have to recognize this is nineteen twenty dollars, right? right. Uh, and um, and so uh, it, it just kept going to the point that uh, you know he in nineteen twenty dollars got it up by June nineteen twenty to like two and a half million dollars. So he then began depositing the uh, the money in the. Han, uh, Hanover Trust Bank in Boston. Uh, he, he intentionally went to uh, one of the smaller banks in the hope that once his account got large enough, he could impose his will on the bank or even make it as the, uh, the bank's president uh, and, bought, uh, and bought a controlling interest in the bank for, uh, through himse uh, for himself and several of his friends by depositing the money. So essentially, he, uh, using his Ponzi scheme, suddenly became a banker. Wow. Uh, and so he, he by 19 uh, July 1920 he's making millions people were mortgaging their homes and investing their life savings a typical story right like that that happens in these scenarios and of course the same scenario which is you know he basically makes sure that everyone that invests is getting paid by the uh, new investors coming in and rolling that money. And uh, it was to the point that in his heyday, nearly 75% of Boston's police, the police force had invested <laughs> into the Ponzi scheme. Whoa. I don't think they would have been like the police force or not. Uh, Boston police are not the best. No, people you, to piss off. You, uh, you don't fuck with the Boston police. That's for sure. For sure. Right? Yeah. And, um, 
so then by uh, by July 19 uh, 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 July of 1920 uh, the, um, a, a bunch of articles started coming out about Ponzi's money machine uh, Clarence Barron who is a financial journalist for the Dow Jones Industrial Company, which went on to, I, I do believe Clarence Barron, I think that's the same as the one that started Barron's magazine, but I'm, I don't quote me on that. I didn't research that in advance, but started to observe the fantastic returns and himself uh, started to observe that, well, isn't it weird that uh, uh, Charles Ponzi himself was not investing in his own company? Huh. Oh. Red flag. Red, Red flag. flag, right? And um, and so, nonetheless, he, he then did calculations based upon this postal sh- uh, sch- scheme and suggesting that in order at this size and magnitude that Ponzi's built the company, that there should be like 160 million of these postal reply coupons, these uh, ICRs or whatever, in circulation, yet only 27,000 of them actually were circulating. In other words, the, the, sh- the, the Ponzi scheme outgrew the actual amount of these um the postage things that were out there it right? sounds just by- like bernie bernie madoff how that one guy remarkable uh, i can't remember the guy's name but he figured out that there wasn't there was no way there was no enough open interest in the contracts options to trade yeah exactly right and so when when it all unraveled it brought down five other banks in addition to hanover trust well, uh, and so the uh, the investors were practically wiped out, receiving less than thirty cents on the dollar. Ponzi, as investor, oh, it, it, everything got destroyed. Uh, th- there was like a, over twenty million dollars of loss, maybe a couple hundred million in today's dollars or more. Uh, a lot of people do compare that to Bernie Madoff, similar scheme in terms of the size and magnitude of that. Obviously, he spent his life in jail, um, and uh, and the scheme. Uh, uh, did a, a lot of damage back then and uh well you know it's interesting though he at least gets to claim a ponzi scheme is named after him because it's not going to be called the madoff scheme and he, it's still going to be called a ponzi scheme he was the first and uh and so it's interesting uh that and that's your little uh this week in history well that's a great story patrick i had a couple of thoughts first of all i i was wondering if when he got caught if he would have, have escaped and come up to Canada, but if he did come up to Canada, he wouldn't go to Montreal. He would obviously go to Vancouver, where he fit right <laughs> at home. And uh, <laughs> second of all, I was looking at it, and I, I don't know if you did this Rain Man kind of impersonation uh, like on purpose or if you read this, but I did put in $420,000 and $1920 comes out to $5.368 million. So you're pretty well bang on correct. Oh, there you go. There you yeah. go. And and that's assuming that you believe the inflation numbers you're inputting there. But anyway, that's a, that's a whole different uh, that's a, a whole different story. Anyway, Kev, let's move on. Okay, WTF for the WTF clip of the week. Yeah, yeah what, so what, this what one was easy easy for me because uh, I I went and I came across um, John McAfee, right. who recently has backed out of his bet. And for he those, backed out of it. What what? How did he do that? He said that, uh, for those who don't know, John McAfee is a, a, an ardent uh, Bitcoin bull. He said that if Bitcoin didn't hit a million dollars by 2020, the end of 2020. Yeah, he, he would, would eat, eat his own dick. Eat, well, I was going to say it nicer, but okay, yeah, we'll go with that. And so we were he all... He was going to chow on his penis. How do you say it nicer? <laughs> I was just How do you say, say it nicer? I was going to say something like he was going to eat a private part or something oh. a little more subtle even. But you go, you went for it. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll just chalk that up to a regular He's the one who the said it. I'm not, I'm uh, not the one that okay. went there. He, John McAfee went there. I'm just... So I'm he just, moped uh, out. He, he, completely, he completely came back and he sent an email say, or a uh, tweet out saying something to the effect like, this was all a publicity stunt. Look at how much publicity I got it for uh, Bitcoin. You know, ha, 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 you fools, right? <laughs> so this guy is a piece of work. And what's amazing oh. is that people actually went and were quoting him as, a, you know, some sort of guru when it comes to uh, this sort of, uh, I don't know, crypto investing. And so one of the things is I didn't realize this, but he's running for president because why not? You know what? Right. You're you're a Bitcoin expert. Why not run for president? And this week's <laughs> WTF video. Needs- why not? If Trump yeah, can why- be president, I mean, <laughs> exactly. why can't McAfee? Why not? Why not? <laughs> and uh, 
in this week's video, actually, I didn't need to do any editing except for I did trim it down because there were some parts that were a little bit. I thought, ah, you know what? I'll, I'll take that part out. That doesn't need to be in there. Well, because his so prostitute it. wife was doesn't want him to eat his own <laughs> penis. <laughs> Okay, Patrick, God help me. <laughs> you're not allowed to drink before the show anymore. You're, you're cut off. Anyways, listen, let's just roll the tape. For those who are interested, John McAfee, the Libertarian candidate for president 2020. Here we go. In chaos... Power is powerless. Power only works when there is a structure through which power can flow. The boss, the second in command, the third in command, the fourth in command, the peon. When that breaks down and the peon no longer is listening, and the peon goes, I'm mad as hell and I'm not taking this shit anymore, then chaos reigns. I carry armament because I believe in my heart, and so does my wife, and so does my security man, that the Sinaloa cartel is trying to kill me. The largest cartel in the world, the most powerful and richest organization on the planet. John? Yeah. We've had a visitor. He's standing right here. You can see where the leads are totally gone. A wheel turned right here into the mud. But we need to get some fucking traps up here. Do you think uh, Jimmy could get us some firecrack and we could remotely detonate? Uh, yeah. John Poole, my bodyguard. Probably the, the scariest uh, motherfucker I know. <laughs> the problem is the following. All of our power grid, and America's power grid is 50 years old, is controlled by computers that are 20 years old, using software that was designed before the word cyber warfare was even coined. So it is so easy for anyone to get into our power grid computers, hack them, shunt our power around in such a way that it will burn out one substation after another until we have no power and no means of ever repairing them. I think it is optimistic to believe that 10% of our population could survive in a cyber war. Here's the question. Why do not they not push the button today? The Chinese always think generations ahead when they make a decision. And perhaps it is far more sophisticated than just killing us all and walking in and taking over. Everybody in America should carry a pistol. This is a dangerous country. When does the revolution come? It comes when chaos reigns supreme. Do you not see chaos? Do you not see a non-politician in Donald Trump telling people to smack people when they're up doing a debate and they're laughing at each other about how they apply their makeup? If this is not chaos, if this is not a clown show, what is it, please? So is this your moment? This is the only moment that we have had, and it may not come again for hundreds of years. We must seize it now. <laughs> He's really worried about the power grid. You know what? <laughs> I, 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 though I do agree that wh whoever is the next president should invest into infrastructure. I'm in, I'm in that camp. I think. Yeah. I think that's well, a good I, I don't think that's but, what but, he's. Like, but I don't, I don't think, that's think that's where he's, where he's going at. Yeah. Well, I also think every American should own a a, a handgun. And that guy, and and I guess, do we all need bodyguards like he has? Like, I'm not oh, sure. Yeah. That's pretty badass. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyways, John McAfee, you are uh, a true piece of work. Thanks for the uh, the great video. Good luck to you in 2020. Hell, you know what? <laughs> Stranger things have happened. You know, if you told me that Trump was going to be president, you know, eight years ago, or whatever, I would have told you you're nuts. So wouldn't it be hilarious if John McAfee won? It's uh, great to be Canadian. All right. So let's keep let's uh, hey, go. No, no. <laughs> OK, whoa, whoa. We got, but let's fix that before everyone's mad at us. Our prime minister is is also um, known to be kind of, uh, let's just say, an idiot at times. We are by no means claiming that ours is better. He has oh, yeah, policies that are, that are just absolutely crazy. He's recently grown a goatee that makes him look like he's like in some sort of Disney movie or something. There's something really strange. <laughs> he, he wears 
crazy socks. And not only that, he's got the worst energy policy that's ever known to man. I would have thought that his, since his dad screwed it up so bad that he might actually smarten up and do something smart. But no, that's obviously he's incapable of that. So just so you know, we are by no means thinking that we are better than you guys. Our guy is just as much an idiot. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, so here we go. Uh, let's let's get on top three things to watch next week. All right, so Kev, let's uh, let's just dive right into it. So, what's number three? The Chinese New Year holiday begins. And Patrick, I actually put this one there. And although you would think, what's the big deal? I'm beginning to actually wonder if this January effect that we see in the markets. Because let's face it, January. Uh, 19 was strong. Now it was off of low base because of the problems the year before, but January 18 was also strong. We're definitely seeing January being the new strongest month. I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if this is something to do with China and the Chinese gamma roll off. No, I don't think it's the Chinese gamma (laughs) roll off, but I do think it might have to do with them pumping uh, liquidity into the system for their new year holiday. And I know that sounds crazy and nuts, but you know, yep, that's what I was thinking, but I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> okay. Well, anyways, <laughs> so it comes, the holiday comes on the, the holiday comes, I think this Friday, I'm not really sure, but watch for that to be the top in the stock market. I'm calling it. All here. right. Uh, yeah, oh, that's awesome. Let's, I, I'm dying to find out. Okay. Number two. Okay. So we get market flash PMIs for the U S EU, UK and Australia. I think it's going to okay. be important to watch these, uh, PMIs to see if we're getting uh, the the strength in the economies that the market is already priced in. I don't. I think uh, I think they're going to come in either in line or lower. I, I don't think they beat. So I'm beginning to be in your camp, Patrick. I think the market has gotten ahead of itself, and I suspect that we are going to see more and more surprises in terms of uh, economic numbers disappointing. All right, and so, so watch one, for the ten- strongest numbers you've ever seen. <laughs> Okay, Number so we one. got three. We we got three central banks on deck. We got the ECB, BOJ, yeah. and the Bank of Canada on deck. Just to warm up the uh, Fed next week, right? The week right, after, that. right? Yeah. And, so but, it'll uh, be in, it'll be interesting to see what. Which happens. one are you watching? Which one are you watching the closest? I'm watching. I mean, Bank uh, of Can- I'm watching Bank of Canada. I, yeah, I think it's a big I deal. Too. I th- I think you've, you've been a- you've been ribbing uh, Polos quite a bit, and uh, and so it'll be really interesting uh, as to. I haven't been ribbing him. Uh, Andrew Bell's the one that called him. Yeah, uh, he did. The candy man. I was shocked at that. I, I was when I watched that video. So for those who don't know, I wrote a post and I included this uh, video of uh, BNN reporter Andrew Bell grilling, grilling. Like let's face it, grilling uh, uh, Stephen Polos, to calling him the candy man, and that he's handed out all sorts of free uh, low interest rate loans that's fueled our uh, housing bubble. bubble. Yeah. And yeah. listen, he's not all wrong. No, he's and not. Good, g- and good we for him. We should get him for- on the show. We should get him on we the show. We should. Andrew, here you go, buddy. Open invite. Anytime you want to come on, and uh, you can hold our feet to the fire just like you did to Polos. <laughs> I love it. All mm-hmm. right. But anyway, so uh, w- and is there anything you're watching on the Bank of Japan? You think it'll influence uh, the fact that I'm winning on our uh, currency trade? No, I think the Bank of Japan is going to be the most boring. The ECB will probably be more exciting to watch. We're going to yeah. hit a point where uh, the e- uh, Lagarde has recently announced that she's starting the uh, the review of the ECB policies. And this is something that we haven't done since 2003, Patrick. Uh, I think we're on the cusp of a dramatic change in Europe, and it'll be interesting to see how it how it unfolds. But look for the ECB to really change its its stripes. And I, uh, you know, I, I although I think it's crazy and nuts, it looks like they're going to do it through these green bonds, these climate bonds. And uh, I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if they if they figure out a way to to get it so that they're actually just directly printing these things for uh, just so they can spend money. Right. I don't right. know. I'm not sure. Just expect the unexpected when it comes to this because well, you know what? the surprises uh, are going to be to the upside in terms of them spending money on I, on climate change. I, I You know, when I see all these different things that we have in the top three and then we look at the fact that there was this big uh, exp- uh, uh, option expiration roll off and uh, obviously there could be a few more days uh, where the market may gravitate higher in the post expiry period but you know it just feel like i've i've been 
it, my, my spidey senses are saying we can't make it through January making new highs. Uh, I feel like what, while I'm not willing to circle a specific day on the calendar, I just feel like the, we're going to be in the midst of some meaningful mean reversion before the uh, the month is through, and uh, and it, like maybe one of these triggers will be will be the thing. You know, you're looking at the Chinese New Year holiday, uh, but maybe it's one of these central banks. But something is gonna. Uh, all it needs is a spark, a trigger, or something to to just get the ball rolling the other way. It feels like that, don't you think? Yeah, I don't disagree. And one of the things that I worry about is that this time, you know, we could have. S- it feels even worse than last time. Last time it was the XIV exploding that, uh, or imploding that caused the, the real sell off. What if it's more of a fundamental nature? Because although we had rallied a long way, that was on the backs of tax cut in 2018. There was actually more changes in the marketplace that had kind of, uh, let's just say offered a fundamental reason to get long. This one, yes, you could argue that the change in the Fed's policy has been one of the kind of impetuses for to cause the rally. But th- that liquidity that the Fed has put in is is fickle. And I could easily see them kind of figuring out that they've pushed a little too hard on it and pulling back on it, either through, you know, cutting back on their their repos or something like that, or even just doing too much TGA, which is the Treasury General account. Yeah, I just feel like we're 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 very close to a to a point where we stretch the market so far, and it's not stretched on a fundamental basis, but more on a technical basis due to liquidity. I right, know that's right. a very unpopular cra- uh, opinion. A lot of people say it's not QE. All these reasons why it doesn't affect the stock market, it shouldn't be going up. I call BS. I think it is going up because of the liquidity, and uh, and it doesn't really matter. We'll see in a, in a week or two when the Fed you know reverses that whether whether we're right or not. All right. I like it. I like it. Let's do it. Let's talk about parting words of wisdom. Please leave some uh, wisdom for our uh, listeners. Well, you so do it. You. This is one of yours. You actually dug this one out and you liked it, so I'll let you do it. Uh, I dug this one out? You did. Okay, you anyway. sent me an email saying, you've got to put this in for the parting words of wisdom. Fair it was enough. from our friend. It was from our friend, Clen Dathew Capital. Right, Kieran, and, and Kieran, Kier- yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been he he was a great interview. Any any of our listeners that haven't listened to him, uh, you got to circle back. Uh, we got to figure out what episode that was number. Oh, that God, was, it was a long time ago. It, it was so really yeah, smart should, young should, guy, and he yeah, and he's, we related, have he's related. Yeah, he's related to one of the founding members of Renaissance Capital. So it's actually For a fascinating sure. interview. So the so his quote is hubris is one of the great renewable resources. <laughs> <laughs> It's, By PJ O'Rourke. Yeah, that's a, that's a classic. I love it. I love it. Yeah. All right. So um, I love the picture, by the way, Kev. Yeah, yeah I, I, I was really surprised somebody was able to get a picture of you on your way to Vancouver. Yeah. And you, what did you like uh, get Luke to, uh, to, to yeah, send it to it? <laughs> For those who it's, don't know and can't see it, make sure you go and get the album art or wherever it is uh, for this week because you can see Patrick on his way to the Vancouver with a, a good dozen or half a dozen beers, actually more, <laughs> nine beers ahead in front of him and pass out on the plane. Anyways, thank uh, you for listening. Right. Make sure. Yeah. You, uh, actually, you know what, Patrick? We didn't plan this, but let's just talk about this anyways. One of the things that would really help us, and we don't ask for very much, but if, if you have made it this far, chances are you actually like the show. If you could go, and, chances are, <laughs> chances are, you if you could go and um, give us a review on iTunes or, or wherever it is, it would greatly be appre- it would greatly be appreciated because share the huddle help, love, share the huddle love because that would really help us getting guests, and the more people we get listening to the huddle, the better it is, the easier it is for us to book guests. And we've yeah. had some great guests recently. And, and, you know, and to get free beer sponsors, right? That's right. The, the, that's right. The, the more free beers we get versus having to buy them, the happier yeah. we are. And the happier we are, the better the show is. Not too many free beers for Patrick, though. We have to cut them off. There's going to be <laughs> limits. But anyways, just do us a favor. Please go review the show. It would be really appreciated. Like, we really appreciate it. For it sure. would really help us out. Anyways, yeah, uh, thanks for listening. Uh, you can catch me at themacrotourist.com, where I'm actually writing on a more regular basis now, so make sure you go 
and subscribe. It's a free letter there. And if you want to catch me on Twitter, it's at Kevin Muir, M-U-I-R. And Patrick, where and can, can they find you? You can find me at Patrick Serezna on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at LinkedIn. And you could also just hit my website, Big Picture. <laughs> Big picture trading.com anyway and so uh any final closing words we had there kev no not really patrick that's it make sure you stick around for lena's review of the beer i know that's a fan favorite anyways thanks for listening this long yeah. and uh, see you next week thank you very much everyone and have a have a great weekend lena hop on here hi patrick what was it what's so stuff. funny was You're it was i bad lena it. No, I was about to send you a message saying, wrap up the show. Because we were like, oh, let's talk about this picture. And I was like, no, you got to wrap <laughs> no. up the show first. I know. That's what I was saying. Like, I was thinking <laughs> that you should do the picture in the wrap up. Like, this is the important part. Anyways, Oh, my Lena. God. This is what happens when you guys have too many beers towards I, the end I'm of the good. Show. It's, it's Patrick. It's Patrick. I know. I Like, well, I'm, I'm a... You know what? I was trading all day with uh, with uh, my big picture trading members and everything uh, out here in Vancouver. I had a four hour trading session, and I was talking and and it's the hour change. So like I I was up like at four in the morning after that flight here, and so after I I ran back here to record the huddle. And uh, I cracked open a beer and then another one and then another one. I'm, it, it's like I just needed this. It's uh, yeah. it, it's it's, it's, I'm, a, it's I'm a Canadian relaxed. tradition. It's a Canadian a Cana- tradition. Yeah. So, Lena, kill what do you the, think of this beer? Booze. <laughs> yeah. What? Well, have you ever seen that? Uh, that I think it's the the new girl or whatever it is they, that they have something and they say you treat outside wounds with rubbing alcohol. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you treat inside wounds with drinking alcohol. <laughs> Love it. So, Lena, what Love do you it. think of the beer? Um, like I mentioned before, I think I like the pale ale we had. Oh, we weren't, we're not featuring the pale ale this week. You know, well, Granville's not going to send us any more freaking beers because of you. Well, they, 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 listen, we are not. Like, we, not are, we are this. not. We are not featuring the English Bay Pale Ale. We are, we're working <laughs> on this beer. So let's feature like the it. beer that we well, sponsored. So why don't okay. we use the, the beer by name? We, we are featuring this week the Lion's Winter Pale Ale. So it's Lion's Lena, Winter Ale, not Pale Winter Ale. ale. Winter <laughs> ale. Okay. Okay. So I ruined okay. it. See, like this is why you're the introducing of the beer sponsor, not me. So Lena. Yes. Give it. How is the Lions Winter Ale? I would give it a seven point seven. All right. Okay. I'm gonna go next. I think Lena's being generous. This <sighs> is Lions Winter Ale. It sounds like something the Nordlings would uh, drink on uh, Game of Thrones, and they would probably spit out. <laughs> I'm oh going. My God. I'm, go- I'm going five one. That's what? Like like this. Oh my God! You know what? That's it, Grand. You know so what? So Granville, just my, listen. My, if you're, if my you're listening, whoa, 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 whoa. one second. If you're listening, Granville, I gave your other beer a perfect score. So okay. this averages out to seven five. Okay. <laughs> I mean, considering this is a seasonal ale too, right? It's not well, really their core but, beer. Yeah. It, okay. Well, let's just uh, keep it seasonal then. Okay, there it is. Patrick, what do you think about it? Uh, I'm going to give it a 7.7. You know, I, 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 I'll I agree that this is all not... All that puffing and puffing, that, you want to give it a 7.7? No, 7. All, I'm, I just, look, I, no, listen. It, 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 listen, I actually like this beer, and I actually think our <laughs> well, listeners should ignore... Like beer. No, no, I think our listeners should ignore Kevin's ridiculous review. And if you have the opportunity to try this beer, I think you should. Uh, it's it, it was it was a good beer. I think that uh, I I do, you know I don't know whether I would buy a two four, but I think that if I grabbed a four pack at the at the thing, I would drink it. I'm in. I'm in. Seven point seven. Okay. Well, there you go. I think Patrick has a lot of inside wounds to heal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> It's like four in the afternoon there, and you're already kind of like half in the bag. What are you gonna do for the rest of the night? You're gonna be asleep at like six o'clock. Uh, no way, man. I've got I've got a, a good buddy out here, and I'm gonna go visit him and do dinner, and uh, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna go out drinking. It's it's good. I actually have tomorrow off. The the Vancouver Resource Conference is running Sunday Monday, so I literally can get drunk tonight and still have an entire day off tomorrow to recover. So I'm nice. Gonna, well, I mean, there you go. You know you're, so you're, going couple, you're going hard. You're going hard. Well, 
as hard as a as a 45 year old man can go. And I'm not I'm not 23 anymore. But, but I said I'm, pardon. I said <laughs> anyways. <laughs> Sounded terrible. You said it, not me, buddy. I just I just want to remind you what you just said. You said I I'm I'm, gonna, I'm as hard as a 45 year old man can go. Okay. Thanks for sharing that with us, Patrick. <laughs> Much appreciated. I'm not going to say anything else. Okay, you guys finish the show. I'm just going to not say anything <laughs> from this point on. <laughs> Lena, you have to cut him off from drinking too much out of the show. Yeah, I think we just have to give him a, give him a It's going to be like a hard limit. Like, it's like pre, just pre-show drinks are limited to this. Yeah. <laughs> Although it is like fun. It does make... It does a timer release. <laughs> okay. Okay, Pat, Lena, what do you have planned for this weekend? I have a birthday party to go to tomorrow. Oh, whose birthday party? Uh, it's a good friend of mine. Um, she is turning, she's still in her 20s, actually. Oh. Her, soul. Um, her last year of 20s, so we're going to celebrate that tomorrow. Hopefully it won't be too cold tomorrow. Apparently there's supposed to be some sort of storm, so we'll see how that goes. So what but are you guys doing? Exciting. What are you guys doing for her last year of 20s? You're uh, hopefully doing something exciting. Oh, we're going to a bar. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Nothing too exciting. <laughs> My woohoo days are over. So Your what days? My woohoo days. Oh, yeah, the woohoo girls. I forgot about that. Why yeah. don't you explain to people what woohoo girls are? So, you know, when you're downtown in a big city, it could be Toronto, it could be New York, I'm sure any other big metropolitan cities. On a Friday night or a Saturday night, you could be, you know... In your apartment or in your house or whatever, if you live downtown, you're going to start hearing, I don't know, starting at 11 o'clock, maybe a bunch of girls, maybe it's a bachelor party, maybe somebody had a divorce, they're celebrating something and they're down the street, kind of drunk, going woohoo, you know, with everything. <laughs> the woohoo girls. Yeah, so I call them like woohoo it. girls and one of the reasons why I don't live downtown anymore. <laughs> you, should, you should make like a National Geographic special kind of like spoof. Oh, yeah. S seen here in the wild. <laughs> That's the, right. the, the native Canadian Torontonian woohoo girls. <laughs> Be careful with them if they're especially if they're over 40 and still doing this. That <laughs> you know, there's different different levels of woohoo girls, too, you know. Okay, what are the different levels? So, like, the ones in Toronto, I find, even if it's, like, minus 20 degrees outside, that's in Celsius, yeah. Um, they would still be in mini skirts or shorts with nice heels. Their feet are exposed, but they'll still walk around in snow. Yeah. Because they got liquid courage in them. Yeah. And then there's ones in Vancouver by 2 o'clock or whenever they come out of the clubs, they don't yeah. have their shoes on. They just walk around Granville Street, bare feet, with their heels Why? in their hands. I don't oh. know. <laughs> oh, they just don't like the heel. Well, they're kind of more granola in Vancouver, right? Well, these girls don't look granola, though. <laughs> That's the oh. problem. <laughs> well, maybe they're, you know, they're Vancouver, so maybe it's just a little more heroin or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So there's I'm there's different types of woohoo girls per region, I guess. Okay, well, listen, uh, send us uh, your what your region is in terms of the, your woohoo girls. We'd be curious. <laughs> you should make it, Yelena, I really think you should make a, you know, a video on this. I, I Go should around. research, yeah. Yeah, do it. And what would be the male equivalent of the woohoo girl? Oh, I don't know. Okay, well we're gonna have to figure I'll that have out. I'll figure something out. I almost have, I almost thought of uh, finance bros, like you had mentioned a few weeks back. But the finance um, bros. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you the guys are just oh, the on a completely day. on a completely different note? Did you guys ever watch that um, video on um, the spiders on drugs? That, that one special uh, they did where, like, spiders on cocaine and all this stuff like that? No? No. Oh, no, my God. What are you watching? Oh, my God. Know. All right, all right, all right. Okay. You know what? You know what, Patrick? Know. Listen, send I'm us the link. We'll, we'll put the link in the show. We'll put the link. Uh, send Lena the link, and we'll okay. put it in the show notes, like, at the, uh, the bottom. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we'll spiders on it. drugs by Patrick, <laughs> who was no mean, no way was he on drugs while he found this. <laughs> Okay. Like, no. no way, not a chance, not a chance. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything else. Okay. You guys got to watch this, all right? Okay. And, uh, all right, actually, forget it. All right, I'm going to actually uh, send this right now, and you guys got to watch this. All right, hold on. I'm well, no, we're not going to. We're not. Well, listen, I want to go, Patrick. 
You got lots of time. You're in Vancouver. You got <laughs> like a couple of, you got a couple oh, hours Jesus. to kill before you all go right. drinking. So you're trying to like get me to watch Spiders. On all, right, all right, all right, I'll all right. I'll watch right. it later. Have a great weekend, everyone. Um, thanks for listening this long, and don't forget to give us a, a kind of a review. All right. Have a great weekend, everyone. Have a good weekend. Hey, thanks, guys. All right, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The wood spider is the most accomplished of all web-building species. Recently, scientists gave these tiny creatures a variety of psychoactive drugs to observe their effects on web building. When given a minute dose of LSD, the spider's web took on an unfamiliar, minimalist structure. When given caffeine, the web structure was not affected, but the spider's behavior was. Given THC, the active ingredient in marijuana, the spider didn't build a web. It built a hammock, where it lay all day and watched the caffeine spider go. When given alcohol, the spider built a web, found a mate, and raised over a hundred young. But the mate got a restraining order, and now the spider can't go within a hundred centimeters of the web. The crack cocaine spider figured building webs was for suckers, waited till the caffeine spider was exhausted, then came up behind it and popped a cap in its ass. Nice web. Mr. Crack Spider. When winter came, the marijuana spider had no place to live. It ended up in the crack web as the crack spider's bitch. For more information on the crack spider's bitch, contact the Canadian Wildlife Service in Ottawa.